if you like neat trouble free growing of tomatoes and you don't need a lot of production then go with dwarf Hey everybody, this is Brent in Central Arkansas. Today, I'm gonna to talk to you about my dwarf tomatoes and some observations I've made from them. My dwarf tomatoes are in these two lines. You can see a dwarf here, 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 all the way to right here, and then next to it are indeterminates and they're growing up and over. So my dwarf tomatoes are less than the height of this uh, cage here which is four foot every single one that i have i have dwarf tomatoes back here along here so there's about what one two three four five on this row and two three four five on this row and so the way that they're intermingled just happened to work out this way but um several things i've noticed about the dwarf tomatoes the first are that they're obviously compact and they're consistently compact between these two lines. In this row, I've bred my cultivar Brandy Bear with a dark tomato line. I don't want to re uh, name the, the tomato lines, but it's just not in my nature to reveal the breeding background besides my own background. The other one over there is a red tomato this one's dark you might call it purple you might call it brown or black but anyway it's not really any of those colors that's why i call it dark it's just a darker dark color uh tomato but uh over there is red so what i was trying to get are two parthenon carpet varieties one dark and one a red crossing to the dark gave me both dark and red you can see here this one's developing and um and that one will be a red one the i'm trying to think here if it was number two or number three number three i think there's two in that one and uh there's two in the one behind that too but the back plant was dark so i didn't get a lot of dark tomatoes i got a lot of reds but anyway uh continuing on um getting the tomato plants um well, I don't have to support them very much because compact, uh, their nature is to be compact. And my breeding of Brandy Bear to them has made them consistently compact. And my research online and a lot I've seen from dwarf tomatoes, they can tend to get quite tall, four to five foot um, easily. And if you look at them, they're actually quite a bit taller than that in a lot of uh, videos and a lot of pictures but mine have stayed at this height less than four feet while all the others are growing way up and are starting to cross over so i would say a lot of mine right now at the same age the indeterminates are around eight foot this just kind of an average uh eight foot the dwarf tomatoes their foliage is Christmas tree like at least on my two lines I think part of that has to do with brandy bear but part of it's obviously the dwarf characteristics and if you look here you can see the leaves kind of have like this uh, texture on them and they're dense and close together which gives them kind of the impression of a Christmas tree and I really like that and it's done most uh, mostly on this one here but it's also done a little bit on these over here. There's some variation in this side, which I don't really care for. There's less variation on this particular one. So my inclination right now is to select this side here. And this was a cross with a dark tomato. Like I said, I got both red and dark. Now dwarf tomatoes are not known to be uh, disease resistant at all. And I mean at all, they don't breed for it at all. 
if there's any disease resistance in any lines out there in the dwarf projects, uh, it's by accident because the parents might have had some disease resistance. But most of my research from people that have grown dwarves, uh, it's a hit and miss depending on your area, but a lot of times they're plagued and go down before indeterminates will grow down. In my particular clay, uh, uh, in my particular case, my indeterminates this year have had a spot disease. I think it's bacterial spec. It may be septoria. I'm not quite sure. I'm barely keeping it under control over here. In the main garden, it's doing quite a bit better, but I'm breeding for disease resistance over there. But majority of my plants over here are brandy bear, and that is the mother or father, however you want. It's one of the parents of these two dwarf lines. And what's really kind of weird about this, and brandy bear has some disease resistance in it for, that came from one of its parents. What's really interesting about my dwarves, especially this line here, is I'm not seeing the disease in my dwarfs like I am with my indeterminates. And that really shocked me. So if I take my research and where people are saying that they succumb to disease pretty good because the dwarf people that bred them, Craig Lou Hollier and um, I can't remember her name. She's from Australia. Uh, but anyway, they're the ones that majorly headed dwarf tomato project. Uh, they'll, they'll, they've said many times they, did, they didn't breed for disease. Um, obviously because they're carrying forward dwarf lines. It's like what I did in the beginning. I can totally understand where they're coming from. When I first started with my parthenocarpic lines, my total focus was on getting parthenocarpy. And so I can imagine their total focus was on getting quality dwarf tomatoes that taste good and have a good shape and colors and all that. And then they, they, have, they have not gotten around to doing disease yet. In fact, I read something that Craig said that they're not going to. That's not in the scope of the Dwarf Tomato Project. So all this to say that in my case, there is some leaf spot, but I've not picked off the leaves. Um, maybe one or two a little bit, but I just let them go and they're not succumbing uh, to disease. And they're still producing. You can see some production here which brings me to my next topic. In my particular case of creating these dwarves, because I created these two dwarf lines myself. I crossed my brandy bear, like I said, to a couple different dwarf varieties, and it has brought on dwarfs uh, and an understanding of dwarf growing uh, for my particular case. In other words, the plants that I crossed to and my experience is limited to these two dwarfs. But the one thing I've noticed in my case, and I have to say this because there's gonna be people that'll disagree, but um, dwarf tomatoes do not produce anywhere near the amount that indeterminates do. Like I'm getting lots of fruit off of my indeterminates, mainly in the main garden out there, uh, but also some here too as well but my dwarf tomatoes are not keeping up at all. So whenever you consider growing dwarfs, you have to take the advantage with the disadvantage. And in my case, I think there's equal amounts of advantages and disadvantages. If you have the space, the time, and you want to go to the trouble of um, keeping indeterminate lines under control, pruning them, and carrying them up and caging them and you know doing all the work that's necessary for an indeterminate tomato so that you can get more production more fruit to eat then indeterminate is the way to go if you're just a patio gardener or you just have a small area or you don't want to deal with the unruly nature of indeterminate tomatoes then maybe you would like to go to a dwarf. I would rather have dwarf than determinate tomatoes. Determinate tomatoes are somewhat similar to dwarfs. Um, they produce a lot on the short plant, but then they're done. 
These dwarf tomatoes will continue to grow and produce all season long because they're an indeterminate. The only difference between dwarfs and normal size indeterminates is the length between the leaves. It's called the internode. And they grow more closer together like this between the leaves and the, and the fruit clusters or the flower clusters. <laughs> and so if you have a limited garden and you don't want, you know, a ton of fruit, but manageable, neat, um, everything's, you know, real easy to deal with, then determine, I mean, um, dwarfs are the way to go. And, and I'm liking them more and more simply because that we don't, we're having a hard time keeping up with eating all the indeterminates that I grow as a breeder. I, I get rid of a lot of my fruit with the indeterminates because I'm evaluating them. And evaluating means bricks testing them, cutting them open, checking for seeds, and doing all that sort of stuff. And so when I evaluate them, a lot of the tomatoes I have to toss. You can call it composting if you like, if it makes you feel better, but I get rid of them. Um, the still, even doing all of that, I after I cut them and I assess them, a lot of times I'll put them in a bag and put them in the refrigerator. And so we just eat the dickens out of tomatoes um, every year. And even with assessing them. So with a dwarf, if I did not do that, all of this would be dwarf tomatoes. Because look at them. You don't have to keep up with them. They don't grow very tall. They're in my case they seem to be fairly disease resistant for the type of disease I'm running into uh, they just look pretty they make me feel good just looking at them and I get fruit out of it it's like you see there and over there so that would be more than enough especially if I planted this whole thing and I would never have to mess with them at all so it's really cool in that capacity so if you have a little extra space um, I would go with determinants and and you want fruit production but otherwise I would recommend dwarf tomatoes. All right next to my dwarf here is another breeding of mine. This is going to be a yellow. It's a cross right now so all the fruit is going to be the dominant color in this in this first generation. This is an F1 hybrid and so all the fruit yellow, uh, red is dominant over um, yellow. So all this generation, they're going to be red. So all I'm doing with these three plants here is collecting seed. And that's why I only have three. Now you'll notice that I have trimmed all the leaves off the bottom. And that's because of the disease issue I'm having. What I do when I see signs of disease is I um, cut the leaves off. And then I spray with, a, um, with an antifungal or a fungicide. And um, what I use is... Um, Mancozeb and copper and I mix them together. I'll show I'll have a video on that later But um, it does a really good job at keeping it at bay if you remove the lower leaves as it's happening And it allows the plant to continue producing all I need off of this is this particular seed and I've already saved that So really these three plants they're just continuing so we can eat the fruit so why I'm saying that is because all of these leaves were removed from the bottom to manage disease. Right next to it on this plant here, you can see some of the disease happening. Let me take this particular leaf off here. So I'm not pulling off much leaves, but you can see on this leaf here that there is some disease happening on this leaf, some leaf spot that I'm running into. But if you look up the plant going up, it just kind of stays kind of small. I mean, there's some back here, but I'm not I'm not picking at these much. And then you look the one next to it, there's a little bit going on here. But it just seems like they seem to be pretty much okay. There's a little fruit back here. The disease manifests in the indeterminates, the big ones. Uh, by affecting the cotyledons, not the cotyledons, dang it, the ca um, calyx of the fruit here, the back part of the fruit here. And it, it, 
it displays there, but I'm not getting it in a lot of the fruit that's coming on on the, on the um, um, dwarfs. Not that they produce a lot of fruit in comparison, but it, what I'm saying is that the disease doesn't seem to be affecting the plant nearly as much as all of my indeterminates on this side. And so, for in my particular case, another example here why I'm trying to explain, I'm not worrying about the disease as much in my dwarfs. I'm just not seeing it enough to try to manage it. This is the first row here, and the dwarfs start here. The first three aren't, aren't dwarfs. There are other breedings, but it starts here. The second plant, which is one, two, three, four, one dash five is what I call it. First row, fifth plant. I've got some good fruit set here, and these the fruit on this particular plant is decent size. So I've got good fruit set. I've got somewhat decent size, good symmetrical shape, the little slightly flattened look. Just everything about this sort of resembles the parent brandy bear. Um, it's it's obviously very compact, being a dwarf, and it's also parthenocarpic. It's I already know that when it's hot like now these fruits maybe not these but ones coming on later because a lot of these set before the real bad heat wave but these may or may not be um, seedless i am seeing some seedless fruits in my dwarf so i know it's coming on now the high heat which causes the seedlessness but i think they're roughly about this shape now this one's being torn apart by worms but that's got a good shape to it. This is also one I'm going to take right now. And I think I need to save seed from this particular plant. Now, if you look at the plant going up, it's, it doesn't have that pretty shape. And it looks like a hornworm is eating off of these. Let's see if I can find it real quick. I don't see it. But it, it looks like one has done some damage up here. Anyway. Um, so I'll take that one off and keep that, but the, the dwarfs on this particular row, with the exception of this one I was just telling you about, isn't as pretty, doesn't look as nice as those over there, and that's a consideration. I want the, a dwarf to look really good, and um, this particular plant meets a lot of what I'm looking for. It's got the red color, good symmetrical fruit, um, decent size dwarfs, um, you just don't see a lot of dwarfs that are really big like you do with indeterminates but i'm hoping to breed some size into it as well but for now a medium to medium large size fruits more than enough and that's what the parent is brandy bear typically about eight to ten ounces it would be more than enough for me as a dwarf so this particular plant is something that i'm cherishing right now to carry forward and i only need one if I save the seed from this one, then I will make a whole lot of plants, however many seed there is, of this one next year if I choose. Now this plant is in the second row here. This is the one I was just talking about back here, flipping around. <laughs> Can't even tell what I'm shooting at. Anyway, this is the second row here. And one, two, three. I called this one I'm about to talk about the th uh, two dash three, second row, third plant back because there's two plants in this one the back row is here furthest away from the front and this is the front row i need to take this front one completely out i'm just letting it go right now it doesn't meet any of the qualities i like because the fruit production is very limited uh, but this plant here the back one this is a dark tomato of good size here and i've got two little fruit here that you can tell uh, they're coming on and they got good size these are bigger than the plant i just talked about and they've got great round shape it got meets everything that i want and so this particular fruit is probably going to be the one from this second row so that i can get a dark tomato uh, that meets all the criteria it tastes great the bricks it bricks meaning um, the amount of sugars and stuff in it. Everything was good about it. I think it was 5.5, which is very, it's really good for a, a big tomato. And it's got good size on it. Not huge, but a really decent size. One of the things I don't like about it, 
quite as much as some of the others like the one next to it here is that it's a little bit taller and some of that camera died I had to get another battery um, so I think where I left off is some of that may be the taller plant may be because the plant next to it it's kind of trying to grow in half of this container so it's not getting to spread out as much if it was able to spread out it would probably be a little bit shorter I think that's what's going on anyway you can see here this one's got two in it it's shorter this one next to it's only got one in it. it's taller so it's it's not necessarily the game plan um, with this particular variety yet because it's not far enough along this is the third generation so regardless I'll take a little bit taller plant to get the dark tomato that's dwarf that's got a great uh, shape and everything else I'm looking for another potential is this second row first plant it's got a nice size fruit on it the shape is nice it's not huge but it's got a you know it's hefty enough fruit the problem with this one is I haven't seen Parthenocarpi um, carried forward in this one yet and so I don't see a lot so what ends up happening is that um, I'll evaluate all these all season long and I'll count I've got a spreadsheet that tells the amount of fruit and I take a picture of them I take them before this usually before they have color or a lot of color and then I'll let them ripen in the house because right now the splitting of the fruit is a huge issue this actually is not that bad for this much color so I'll take it when it first shows a little bit of color like on the bottom here long before um, it has a chance to split or potentially split so all said we've got the indeterminates we've got a bunch I've removed from the indeterminates because I no longer need them or they displayed poor um, type for me it's called phenotype meaning what the plant looks like and how it behaves and all that so I've removed a lot of the the plants not a lot but some uh, but I just kind of wanted to give you an idea of a breeder's perspective from someone who's breeding dwarfs taken from indeterminates crossed with another dwarf tomato in the second generation you pick the uh, tomatoes that show dwarf capability and then after you get the dwarf capability then you start selecting for other things and I selected for Parthenocarpi first and now I, th I, may, I can't remember what generation I said these are third generation so now in the third generation I'm, I'm selecting for fruit size I seem to be getting some really good disease resistance um, symmetrical shape nice and round I like when the fruit are very equal to each other throughout the whole growing season um, but yeah I'm having very promising results with this first line here that I crossed with a dark and one plant over here that may be able to carry forward as well so that's it that's how i do it i only need one dwarf to carry forward um well i need one red and one dark and if they meet all my criteria then that's what happens next year i'll have a whole lot of that particular one or two so this is kind of my overview and what i'm noticing with dwarfs versus indeterminates and what I think of it all, if you, in just generally speaking, if you like neat, trouble-free growing of tomatoes, and you don't need a lot of production, then go with dwarf or plant a lot of dwarfs if you want a lot of production, and they're trouble-free. I mean, no trouble at all in my case, but if you like production and the variability, the amount of indeterminates you got your heirlooms and your hybrids and all that uh, then you would and you don't mind the pruning and the, removing the suckers and staking them up or caging them and monitoring for disease and removing the leaves from the bottom to prevent disease and all the care that's necessary for an indeterminate but you want a lot of tomatoes indeterminates the way to go I find a place for both of them because I'm a breeder but if I was not a breeder, I would just plant a lot of dwarfs and, um, and this whole thing would be nothing but dwarfs. How long do we gotta stay here For people we don't know in one lines All of the clothes are designed Fast cars and who knows who 
Yeah, I know what they wanna say. They're gonna ask me if.